Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Melinda Salento. I am the Chief Executive of CEDA, the Committee for Economic Development of Australia. And it's a great pleasure for me to be here with all of you today. And of course, to have the opportunity to facilitate this conversation with the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg. Before we get started, can I begin by acknowledging uh, the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting, various lands across the countries, across the country, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I also always like to acknowledge the role that our um, traditional custodians play in sharing their traditions, heritage and culture with us in the spirit of reconciliation. Um, as always, we also like our viewers to know that we like to tweet from these events. Um, if you do so, please uh, link us into those at, at CEDA underscore news and uh, tag the hashtag, hashtag AUSPOL, A-U-S-P-O-L. Um, viewers, of course, also have the opportunity to ask questions of the Treasurer, which you can do through uh, Pigeonhole. Details of that are available on the live stream webpage. Uh, and the password for today is uh, Auspol as well, A-U-S-P-O-L. Um, we've got a poll that we're asking viewers today as well. Um, the poll question is, what measures do you think are going to provide the most stimulus for the national economy? Personal income tax cuts, business investment incentives, infrastructure spending, or the job maker program? We've only really got a short period of time today with the Treasurer. It's fantastic that he has made time available for us. Uh, so I'm actually not going to take up too much more time. Um, I don't think uh, Josh Frydenberg needs any introduction around the country at the moment and certainly not to this audience. So I'm going to hand over to the Treasurer who's going to speak for 10 minutes uh, and then we'll have 20 minutes of Q&A. So with that, Treasurer, over to you. Thank you. Well, thanks, Melinda, and congratulations to you and Cedar and the team uh, for the incredibly important work that you do in promoting public policy debate about the, the key economic issues of the day. And it's my pleasure to join you uh, in this different format, um, which is a reflection of the COVID environment that we face us, we're all facing right now, but also I think it's, um, it's highly productive to do it this way too. We can reach a lot of people and reach them quickly and um, not have to sit down over a, a long lunch to do so. Um, obviously, I never thought I'd be here talking to you in the week after the budget at a time when the debt and the deficit has reached a record high. But it is a function of COVID-19 and the situation in which we find ourselves with a global pandemic that has hit the the global economy very hard. Uh, as you know, approximately or the equivalent of around 600 million people have lost their jobs. Uh, and here in Australia, we've not been immune. The OECD is expecting the global economy to contract by 4.5% this year compared to just 0.1% during the GFC. And early on in the pandemic, around 10% of our workforce either lost their job or saw their working hours reduced to zero. Um, we were confronted with this pandemic um, after having been confronted with the fires, the floods and the drought. Uh, and our early response had focused on stimulus. Uh, this is what we thought was going to be required early on. And we had some programs to boost investment across the economy at that time. But it quickly became apparent uh, as those long queues formed outside Centrelink, that the economy needed a security blanket. And that security blanket was in the form of the JobKeeper payment, the single largest economic support program that has ever undertaken here in Australia. And at $101 billion, it was supporting more than 3.5 million workers and has been very very much a lifeline um, to businesses and to their staff. Obviously, we doubled the safety net with the Job Seeker Coronavirus Supplement. We put in place the 700 for pensioners, for carers, for others on income support and boost, which we should not forget is a $32 billion uh, measure to provide up to $100,000 to 
to small and medium-sized businesses, and that's been very important in helping them meet their fixed costs as well as um, helping to meet their, uh, their staffing costs and labour costs as well. The combination of all of that uh, was only possible because we approached this crisis from a position of economic strength. The unemployment rate when we came to government was 5.7. As of February, was 5.1. We had delivered the first balanced budget in 11 years. Um, we had brought welfare dependency down to its lowest level in 30 years. The economy was trending in the right direction. And those measures that we introduced helped, according to Treasury, save 700,000 jobs. And but for the those measures, the unemployment rate would have been five percentage points higher, which then leads us into the budget and our thinking about that. And it was very important as restrictions started to ease around the country, outside of Victoria, of course, that we move and transition to the next phase of the economic recovery and away from JobKeeper, which Treasury had said in their review at the midway point of that program, that it had created and had inside it some adversities which uh, became more pronounced as the recovery became more pronounced, which would see workers not necessarily roles across the rest of the economy. So it was really important that we ensured that JobKeeper was a temporary and a targeted measure, and we transitioned to other, to other initiatives. So our budget is all about jobs, and it's focused on creating jobs in three key ways. Uh, firstly, uh, it is about putting more money into people's pockets, and on Tuesday night I announced the, the tax cuts, and by Friday we had legislated that, uh, and that is for more than 11.5 million workers bring forward stage two putting in an additional year of the Lamito, uh, and that has got a focus on low and middle income earners, and that will help. I mean, we've got two $250 payments that are going out, one later this year and one early next year, uh, for pensioners, for carers, for veterans, and others on income support. Those measures are going to help generate economic activity and jobs. The second bucket for the initiatives in the budget are those that enable businesses to hire, to invest and to grow. And there are a couple of specific tax measures there, which are designed to, to boost investment right off to businesses with a turnover up to $5 billion, which will allow them to immediately expense uh, depreciable assets uh, that are eligible for their businesses. So rather than depreciating a harvester over half a dozen years, you can do it all in year one. A trucking company can buy a new truck, a, a, uh, a manufacturer can upgrade a, a production line and then write the, those purchases off in year one. This will cover around 280% of non-mining. Uh, investment. And so the view is that that measure will numbers in 21-22, there's a 6% increase to, to business investment. And obviously, they, these measures are helping to, to drive that outcome. Um, the second is the loss carry back measure. As you're aware, um, businesses tend to use accumulated losses into the future to offset against profits. But these are not normal times. So we're saying businesses can take those losses because they were otherwise profitable businesses, but because of COVID, they become loss-making. They can offset it against previous profits and taxes paid on those profits uh, back to 18, 19. And that will help put more money into, into businesses' pockets, which can then help drive investment, and the view is that that will create an extra 50,000 jobs. There's also the bring forward of the infrastructure projects as well as extra spending on infrastructure. There is an investment significantly in research and development, um, and there's also investment in, in a 50,000 short course 
places, extra undergraduate tertiary places, um, the job trainer program with 340,000 places. These are all designed um, to, to enable businesses to hire, to innovate and to grow. The third bucket is through a couple specific incentives that are designed to tip the balance in favour of new hires by businesses. And I'm thinking particularly about apprentices. And we've got just over a billion, a 50% weight apprentices. And we've also got other measures which have been designed to support existing apprentices. We've also got the job maker hiring credit, which we're focused on those uh, who are under the age of 35. And it's in two parts. If you're 16 to 29 and you've been on Job Seeker uh, in the previous few months and you're taken on as an additional work of 20 hours a week, then, then you will receive as a business $200 a week from government. If you've taken on someone 30 to 35, for at least 20 hours a week and they're additional to your business, to your headcount, to your payroll, then you'll get $100 a week from us. And we think that this will support around 450,000 jobs, according to Treasury. Um, these, the reason why we're focused on young people is because the experience of previous recessions is that it took a long time for unemployment to come back below the rate from where it started but it took an even longer period of time for younger people. And the 80s recession, it took six years to get unemployment back below 6% from where it started in the 1990s. It took a full a decade, but it took 15 years for younger people to come back um, to, to where they started. And we also know the youth unemployment rate today is double the overall uh, rate across the economy. So that's why we're focused on young people. We have other measures um, that support uh, people of other ages, for example, a restart program that supports 50 and over uh, people who have been on unemployment benefits for six months, and that uh, is an up to $10,000 um, payment to businesses. All of those measures add up to our economic recovery plan to help create jobs, and they focus on the government being the catalyst as opposed to the solution to the economic recovery and just finally, um, in terms of some of the headline numbers, uh, it's Treasury's view that unemployment will go from 6.8 where we are today to around 8% by the December quarter, largely driven by what's happening in Victoria. But then even with JobKeeper coming out at the end of March, steadily stepped down to 7 a quarter by mid next year, 6.5 the year after that, 6 after that, and then 5.5 by mid-2024. Um, why is that relevant? Uh, not just it's relevant because more people are coming into employment, but it's also relevant to our broader fiscal strategy, which I set out in a speech ahead of the budget, which set effectively a two-phased approach um, to our approach. The first phase is we allow the automatic stabilisers to work. You provide temporary and targeted measures uh, and you seek to drive unemployment rate comfortably below 6% with the language was the language that I've used. Once you get to that phase uh, or through that phase, then you can start to see the budget numbers come back to a more sustainable footing. And as you know, um, grow the economy uh, rates at these historic lows. you can start to see GDP level approach and then in that second phase to see our debt to GDP levels come down. Net debt to GDP will peak at around 44% at the end of the forwards. Uh, you'll see gross debt to GDP uh, peak above that at around 55%. Um, but again, compared to other countries around the world, it's significantly below where they are. So, Melinda, hopefully that's a, a bit of a summary um, of our thinking behind the budget. 
it's a budget that's got both temporary targeted measures, which are front-ended, designed to, to create a stimulus, stimulus across the economy um, and boost aggregate demand, um, boost economic activity and obviously job creation. But there's also deeper structural longer-term reforms in this budget, including changes around insolvency, responsible lending, our focus on energy, the manufacturing strategy uh, and the like. Um, it's not the budget I thought I'd be delivering, that's for sure, but it is the budget that we believe is needed at this time. Thank you. Well, Treasurer, thank you so much for those remarks. And if I can just pick up on the last one you concluded with, I, I absolutely understand it's it's not the budget that you ever thought you would, would, would be delivering, nor would you ever want to, quite frankly. So let's just start by acknowledging that. Um, I really appreciated the, the fact that you started off by just reminding us of some of the earlier measures that, that had been introduced. Um, you know, it's interesting, I was thinking back right at the beginning, and I think we we're all trying to calibrate how big a hit we thought this was. Um, and I think it really is worth acknowledging the, the speed with which um, your government has just jumped into responding to this and, and thrown, you know, a tremendous amount of stimulus um, into the economy, um, recognising the importance of filling that demand gap um, for a whole bunch of reasons and, and really just the really clear, strong focus on, on jobs, which, uh, which is absolutely where it needs to be. I think my sense from having a look at the reactions and response around the country is that um, everyone really applauds the, the amount of stimulus. I think this is absolutely uncharted waters for us and the rest of the world. I think one of the questions that certainly we've raised, and, and I wouldn't mind hearing your thoughts on this, Treasurer, is just you use the word catalyst, um, and I picked up on that in your comments in the paper today. Uh, I think um, one of the issues I've been grappling with is if you look at what was happening before the COVID crisis, we were really struggling with the level of economic dynamism in our, in our economy. We'd seen business in investment quite stagnant, particularly non-mining investment. We were seeing labour mobility quite low. Um, and I guess my question is, um, how, how do you feel about the role that you're playing in, in catalyzing business investment? What are you looking for? And, and is, is there more to come if you, if you don't see that business um, investment response? And that's why we talked a little bit about um, a structural reform agenda, that, that that's a little bit of the confidence light on the hill to add a bit more momentum to this catalytic sort of um, incentives that, that the budget contained. Well, thank you very much, um, Melinda. Um, well, we've absolutely got to continue to focus on structural reform. Uh, as you know, we've brought forward stage two. Stage three will see very significant structural reform with the elimination of the 37 cents in the dollar tax bracket, the 32 and a half coming down to 30, the top bracket going from 180 to 200, and one big tax bracket and 200,000 where people pay a marginal rate of no more than 30 cents in the dollar. That's a real structural reform. Industrial relations has been an area where the country, I think, would benefit um, from uh, further, uh, further reforms. Uh, with JobKeeper, we were, able, we were able to introduce simultaneously some temporary changes um, so that employers and employees could agree changes around duties and um, hours and the location of staff. And that was really helpful to employers. For example, who didn't have much foot traffic through their retail shops, they could deploy staff to the warehouse or whatever the case may be. Um, and that's been very useful. We're now deeply engaged in discussions between employer groups and unions around five key areas, the casuals and um, and compliance and award simplification, enterprise agreements and, and greenfield sites. Um, we are making progress on, um, on, on those measures and hopefully there'll be more to say in the coming weeks. That's going to be a structural reform that will boost, um, boost the overall... Um, e ..the overall... Um, I think... Deregulation is really important, uh, and and, uh, and so we've got into there. And you know, just the changes I announced around the provision of credit. Um, I know not everyone would be pleased to to see a winding back of responsible lending, um, the the responsible lending um, systems that were in place, but they were becoming restrictive lending uh, processes, and and we've got a level of 
regulation there with APRA with its own lending standard. Uh, and they were becoming increasingly complex and costly and impinging on the provision of credit. So I think that's, that's a, a, a structural reform that will, that will make that will make a difference. Um, and then of course, these investment incentives, I think will drive investment. Um, the point, Melinda, is that fiscal policy uh, has to do more of the heavy lifting because monetary policy has, doesn't have a lot of space to move. And the experience of the GFC was that uh, monetary policy did have a lot of space to move and interest rates were cut by 425 basis points, which was the equivalent of a $100 billion stimulus over a 12-month period. In this crisis, it, the cash rates only come down by 50 basis points, and it's at a historic low of 25 basis points. So it doesn't have that same room to move. I'd like the states to do a bit more, um, not just on the reform piece, but also on the spending piece. On the reform piece, I'm finding that the National Cabinet and the Council on Federal Financial Relations is producing dividends. We got an agreement, for example, around harmonising the occupational licensing laws, which we're seeking to implement. That's been around for, you know, over a decade and everyone's been talking about it but hasn't been delivering it and we're now going to do that. But also the Governor of the Reserve Bank has said that they have the, the balance sheet capacity to spend at least another $40 billion over the next two years or 2% of GDP. So I would like to see the states um, spend a bit more but also... Uh, engage in those structural reforms and whether it's environmental assessments and one-stop shops or whether it's occupational licensing or whether it's planning and zoning and there's a lot of work we've been doing with the PC in that space um, there are some important reforms. Well thanks for those um, for those observations and I think um, you know all of us are sort of looking at this crisis and sort of thinking about um, where's the silver lining I guess and uh, certainly we've done some work on on how um, National Cabinet's been working. I do hope that one of the things that comes, um, that sticks with us, if you like, from this crisis is the capacity to really leverage the federal state relations in a way that can deliver us real bang for buck because, uh, boy, we <laughs> we need it now. Um, can I come back to your comments, Treasurer, uh, around um, the relative importance of monetary and fiscal policy? And it's something that we've been talking about um, internally and, and also in the context of some of the issues that have come up, um, you know, post the budget, uh, and some areas where people were looking for more. And I think, I think from talking to people, one sense I have is that um, that fiscal policy is now expected to sort of cover the whole economy um, in a way that we sort of didn't think about it before. I mean, number one, it has to be much more agile, and people are looking for it to be more responsive in a way that it's not always tailored to be. And number two, I do think there was this sense that everyone recognises the importance of you know, really not losing a generation of young workers to the workforce, but but what else, I guess? It may it may seem unfair to you, but two of the questions that have come straight through um, from our Pigeonhole uh, app have been around, why wasn't there more for women around um, childcare, particularly given, and this was our perspective, this is very much an economic argument around participation and the benefits to the economy. And secondly, um, in a similar vein, someone's asked, you know, why were creative industries overlooked when they too are this massive contributor to the economy? So I do acknowledge this probably feels like you've delivered the biggest budget ever and, and straight, out, straight out of the gate we're asking for more, but I think it is in that context of looking for more from fiscal policy. Well, thanks, Melinda. I, look, in terms of childcare, and you know, I have been asked um, similar questions and I point to the fact there is $9.2 billion in the budget for childcare, which is a record amount. During the crisis, we allocated about $900 million to help keep the uh, various uh, providers um, open um, through the crisis, which has been important uh, to ensure that services are being provided to workers who, who are in critical sectors. Uh, and our, um, our policy is always focused on the low and middle income earners. So you can get an up to 85% rebate, as you know, um, if you're a lower or middle income earner. And that has helped boost female workforce participation to that record high pre-crisis and helped started to see um, the gender pay gap you know, starting to close. It's still got a way to go, but it was starting to close. Um, so they were positive developments off our policy. Um, we obviously have some issues 
with what our political opponents um, put forward. Um, but in terms of what was in the budget for women, all the measures were focused on getting more women and more men into work. And during COVID, the percentage of jobs that were lost that were filled by women was 54%. But in terms of the jobs that have come back as a result of the restrictions being eased and businesses reopening, um, and the percentage of those jobs that have been filled by women, it's been 60%. So those sectors uh, where women have been highly represented are the ones that are now starting to open up most quickly and jobs are coming back. Um, but we obviously are strongly supporting uh, the health sector. We're strongly supporting the education sector. We're strongly supporting research and development businesses uh, whether it's in hospitality or retail or tourism, are going to benefit from the loss carry back measures. They're going to benefit from the investment measures. These are all sectors um, that employ many, many women. And, and so, you know, I totally reject <laughs> uh, that, um, uh, that analysis by some uh, and, and point to the fact that the that our track record as a government has been to see female workforce participation reach a record high, about 60% of the 1.5 million jobs we helped create pre-crisis went to women, and that the measures in this budget are designed to, to support jobs across the board for both women and men. And did, did you want to just respond to the question around creative industries? Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, well, obviously... Uh, we announced an arts package, uh, and there are many arts uh, companies and businesses that are benefiting from JobKeeper, yeah. Sydney Symphony or the Melbourne Theatre Company, or you know, the, li the list goes on. There's a large number um, that have benefited from the JobKeeper program as well as the other support measures that we've announced. But we, we announced individual additional measures uh, for, for the arts sector. Uh, and um, and the form of our support is taking is in a number of ways, and um, that will make a difference to that sector. But we continue to strongly support our creative industries, and for good reason. Treasurer, I think I've got time for for one last question before I know you've got to uh, race off. And I thought. Um, in your budget speech, you talked about a couple of things that we can expect to come, and they are in very important social infrastructure areas, uh, namely uh, mental health uh, and also a response to the Aged Care Royal Commission, which I know the report's not down uh, until next year. But, but both of those um, likely to involve um, additional spending, I would have thought. H how are you framing up those um, responses in the context of the budget and, and what might we see from between here and the budget, which of course is only seven months away? Well, that is, that is right. It's a different um, timeline uh, with a mid-year and economic fiscal outlook statement by the end of the year and then a budget in, in May and a budget now just in October. So um, there's plenty of work uh, for people in Treasury finance and, uh, and for us on the Hill. Uh, in terms of mental health, um, we're at about $5.7 billion today and there was more money in the budget uh, for the psychological um, counselling services under Medicare, um, going from 10 to 20. Um, there was um, obviously more spending for organisations like Headspace and Beyond Blue and, um, and Lifeline, uh, all of which have been doing an amazing job, not just during COVID, but also during... Um, the bushfire season, for example, as well. Um, so we'll have more to say about that. And obviously the, um, there's the, the announcement um, that will come from the PC report. Uh, there's also obviously in aged care, there was money in this budget, uh, particularly around in-home care places. Uh, and that's a substantial boost of 23,000 new places, bring to, to a total of 180,000 um, places. Um, there's uh, obviously a Royal Commission coming back uh, next year and we'll respond uh, as you'd expect us to do to 
to that Royal Commission. And we've already foreshadowed there'll be more investments that will be required then. But aged care funding is at a record level. Uh, and also we, there was a provision in this budget for more in-home care places. Well, Treasurer, uh, thank you for, for those responses and th thank you again for fitting us in. Um, I think we managed to cover a fair bit in, in 30 minutes. For our viewers, if you've got further questions, um, you can continue to submit them through Pigeonhole and we'll do our best to get a response from the Treasurer. I've got you on the hook now. <laughs> um, but uh, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg, thank you so much for your time and to the rest of our viewers, Thank you so much for joining us um, this afternoon. It's going to be a busy seven months before the next budget, I'm sure, and uh, we'll look forward to further policy developments between now and then. Thank you so much.